I want to just lift up this International Women's Month. Oh, how we pray. Passage um, that you want to just for a few minutes from this first chapter of Second Timothy, beginning at verse number one through verse number seven. That'll be just a clip note of our focus for today. If you're there, say Amen. It reads this way: Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. Then he says, verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it's in thee also. He says, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And here's that seventh verse, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind hallelujah lord bless your word as it has already been divinely inspired to be written let it be divinely inspired to be interpreted and even now oh god minister to these your gathered people as people have come oh god all over from everywhere to come to this worship experience i now bless them and bless your name and i pray oh god that even as we focus particularly on this day where we highlight great women of God. I just am grateful for all the people who you've allowed to cover us in our life. And may we always remember, oh God, that we were blessed because somebody gave us a chance. Somebody covered us and blessed us and nurtured us even when we didn't know we were in existence or in the world. So for every woman of God who ever served you, oh God, we say thank you. And even now, oh God, as we come to this worship experience in this word we ask you to oh god already do in advance what we know you've already done and that is oh god get glory from all that we do and all that we say in jesus name the matchless marvelous majestic magnificent name of jesus i pray the people of god said amen and amen oh how we love you oh how we praise you Y'all know I could sing that all day, and we've been worshiping all morning. I want to just take, remember, if you're going to be a great pastor, if you're going to be a great leader, that you can't take credit for everything that happened in your life. And too many people want to take credit for things as if they did it all by themselves, or as if they were able to accomplish it without somebody else. And that is one of the diseases of this generation that we're living in right now. Is they believe that wherever they are or whoever they are came because they pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. But I want to let you know that if you made it this far doing whatever you're doing, and even if you're not doing what you want to do, thank God that somebody gave you a chance to be who you are and to do what you do. Grateful to God today. For while we're looking at a day and age where it seems like people have gone stock raving mad, where we hear in the news things that we thought we would never hear, particularly in our culture, when you be able to understand and come to grips with the fact that there are people 
who are allowing their children uh, to grow to a certain age without exposing them to just decency and morals and common sense. There are people who in their own home, before you ever get to a school, before you ever get to a church, there was some mama in the home who at least made sure that her child, when they walked out that door, wasn't going to be an embarrassment to the family. I wish I had somebody who had mamas like that. And they would tell you, boy, you ain't going to embarrass me. I mean, you, you had your act together before you ever got out the door. You practice at home. Come on here. You, you, you didn't have to learn respect from some police officer with a bully, with a, with a billy club. or You didn't have to learn it from some teacher with a, with a stick. Amen. Just trying to know. You, you got it because your mama had the capacity to instill in you the kinds of things that helped you to become the person you are today. And if there's some things, if you don't get it in there young, baby, it ain't going to be hard to get it in there later. You train up the child, but you got to chain up the teenager. I said you train up the child, but you, you got to chain up the teenager. You, wait, you can't wait till little Ray Ray get to be 15 and then you try to tell him how to act right. No, he didn't have 15 years of cray cray. You should have been teaching him how to pray pray while he's doing all that stuff he's doing right now. You, you have only a certain season to get certain things and values into a child. That's how difficult it is we're trying to now raise up adults that never had a decent childhood. You're now getting to people who themselves are children who haven't raised children. I was telling somebody yesterday, I met a 29-year-old grandmother. Hey Amen. She's 29 years old. Had a, she, and she had a child at 15, and then her child had a child at 14. And here, she's not even 30 years old. Hey Amen. My daughter is 30, and, ain't even, and she ain't even mama yet. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I said, yeah. She ain't listening, but I said, yeah. She's ignoring me, but that's all right. <laughs> but there are some who get to the issue, and the challenge is not that young teenage, young motherhood is something new, because we've seen that within our own community long before. The challenge today is that we've never seen them that young not having somebody cover them and help them to raise the babies that they bring into the world and make sure that they had some decency in making it happen. Children were covered by a village. They were covered by families. They were covered by church families. If a young mother didn't know what to do or how to raise that baby, she'd bring her to church and she had about 12 mamas, if not 20 or 30. Big mamas, covering mamas. You saw... When then Malcolm came in, I would tell him stood up and, 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 and the whole village started grabbing him. His pappy started calling him forward. And there's some mamas that's going to get to him. Because at some point, you remember the people who helped you to get to where you are before you were ever able to be decent for somebody else. Oh, come on, don't act like you've been prime time all your life. Some of y'all still need to go back to the closet. Hey, man, you ain't ready. Amen. If you in church this long and ain't praise God yet, you need to go back home. Amen. Start your praise and worship when you got out to bed and tell the Lord thank you when you woke up this morning. Hallelujah. If you still stuck on stupid and don't think it was your alarm clock that woke you up, I don't care if you sprung forward or fell back. Whatever your clock was, that ain't who woke you up this morning. If it had not been for the Lord, can I get a witness here? Who was on our side? Hallelujah. The alarm clock is going off still on some folk and they ain't moving. If the Lord did not say another chance. Thank God that God has mothering capabilities. 
there's an attribute of God, amen, the sheenness of God. As he, even through the process of looking at his son Christ, who looked at Jerusalem and said, I wish I could have put my arms around you like a mother hen over her brood, her chickens. Thank God he nurtures us and mothers us and cuddles us all night long and holds us in his bosom. And if you had a bad yesterday, but you woke up today, you ought to thank God for a new chance. Lamentation writer says the, the mercies of God are renewed or rebooted every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So with the nurturing nature, I said, must start early in life. Paul is not trying to teach Timothy some things in his 40s that he should have learned, hallelujah, before he was 12. Paul recognizes in this text that the reason why he can do some things with Timothy at this young stage of his life, because as they were aging and going older, you do know that they lived a little longer back in those biblical times, and, and Timothy is considered a young man, and even as he's now in his early 40s, he was considered young compared to his elders. And as he's talking to young Timothy, he's saying to him, Timothy, remember that whatever you're doing, you couldn't have done anything had it not been for somebody who nurtured you and put some stuff in you. And the way that you give back is to at least make sure you are credit to those who blessed you. You must remember that even though mama may not be here watching you physically, she's still looking over the banisters of glory. And that's how the elders used to live. They didn't live for the people who watched them down here because ain't nobody down here going to like you all the time. I said they ain't going to like you all the time, and that's what's wrong with too many people. Like Timothy, they want to be liked by everybody. That's one of the reasons why Paul is straightening them out now because he has this tendency to want everybody to like him as a young pastor. So Paul is saying, Timothy, one of the reasons why I need to get with you and straighten you out is because you're going to have trouble with that church if you get there trying to be liked by everybody and can be respected by nobody. He says to him, Timothy, you need to get into your DNA that everybody's not going to like you all the time no matter what you do. Hallelujah. You hear me say every now and then 25% of people ain't going to like you. I don't care what you do in life. Hallelujah. Another 25% of people like you today, but you ought to be careful looking at them tomorrow. Because somebody else might persuade them otherwise. There are 25 other percent of people who may not like you today, but you might be able to change their mind tomorrow. But then thank God for those people who are going to stick with you through thick and thin. Amen. And that's, that's the group that sometimes you got to surround yourself with. And mama is always the chairperson of that I got my baby club. But the only way that she qualified to be legitimate is that she told you when you were wrong and didn't think it was cute when you were moving in wayward ways. I don't know how some mamas can see some stuff that's going on today and think that it's okay. Amen. I know I got some good mamas in this church because I see where y'all look at some kids every now and then. Amen. And mama's got the babies climbing all over the TV cameras and things toward that. Run. I mean, you know, and, and babies making noise don't bother me. Amen. People, you know, crying and stuff like that. We didn't have babies in church. Y'all bring them babies on. I need them to cry to keep some people woke around them. Amen. Amen. It ain't crying babies. It's sleeping deacons. Amen. And preachers that get me. Amen. Y'all woke today. That's why I'm saying it. Amen. Tell your neighbors, stay woke. Stay woke. Amen. <laughs> See, I'm going to catch you when you ain't looking. Amen. Y'all get one of them crying babies and put them right on up front every now and then. Put one of them in Kelvin's lap. Amen. Let him sit there. Amen. Amen. But uh, so it ain't crying babies that bother me. Amen. It's misbehaving ones. Amen. That you let color in the Bible that you got to read from and not learn to respect the word of God. Come on, talk to me. Some of the ones ultimately that you let call people out of their name and you laugh and think it's cute. Amen. You couldn't call an adult, amen, by their first name when we were growing up. I know it's a new day now today, but you had to put a handle on it. Come on, talk to me here. 
Brother Claiborne, I done got my worst, amen, backhand calling one of my mama's friends by what I heard everybody else call her. Amen. But she was cute. She was fine. And I just thought that maybe I could be a little chummy. Amen. If I could call her, she had a nice sounding name. So I said that she spoke to me. How you doing? I said, hi, Marceline. Oh, listen, Marceline Murphy was some kind of fine. Y'all need to understand that. But I didn't say, amen, Miss Marceline or Miss, Miss whatever that she was mad. It didn't matter. She was an adult. I said, how you doing, Marceline? I didn't even get lean now before my mama's fingernails was in my mouth. Marsha, Miss, Miss, Marsha. They didn't allow you to disrespect people. Even if you had a point to be made, there's a way you had to make it. You didn't just come busting up in here with something to say. And the reason why some people are so short-circuited and get to the place where we look now and they can have the capacity and audacity to do some things we would never think of is because of some covering mama. There's some things my mama been gone 27 years, but I still look over my shoulder sometimes. Amen. Just making sure at some point when I'm thinking about certain things that I know I may not need to think, say, or do because I know she may be looking. In his book on the sublime, one great writer, Longinus, talks about how he lived his life not based on the people on earth, but believing that there are people looking over the balconies of glory, asking the question, oh, what would they be doing in this moment? Or would they be pleased with what I'm doing in this moment? And sometimes we would do better to realize that there are people who are asking the question, uh, what is Charlie going to do now? Uh, yes, what is, is, is Joyce going to do now? At some point, they anticipate that the good they put in you, they can count on you to remember. Paul calls to remembrance. He says, the unfeigned, the unwavering faith that was put in them by these persons. Timothy was a nice, well-mannered, respectful, church-going, loving mama's boy that didn't like conflict. I told you he liked to be, loved to be liked by all, and Paul knew his time was short in his writing. So in 2 Timothy, he knew that during these tough times of conflict in and out of the church, that being liked had to be replaced by being obedient. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you may not like me, but I hope you respect me when I tell you that God wants obedience out of you. God didn't ask you to like him. He already got angels separate, loving him and serving him. He wants to know how obedient you can be to his word. He also, Timothy, wasn't very good and not being distracted and sucked into sometimes useless arguments. 1 Timothy chapter 2, one of the reasons for that text where you see him having to say certain words and things about women, even in church, came because he got sucked into an argument between male and female in the church. He should have taken a level of leadership to not even let it brew to that level. But sometimes you get caught in the arguments that you ain't got no business even talking about in the first place. How many times have you lost relationship with a friend or somebody because you said something that you should have just kept to yourself. Or some of y'all looking guilty right now. Hey Amen. I don't know, Facebook sometimes is one of the worst things, Twitter and some of these others, because some thoughts you never would have known other people had, but they didn't get out there. And you got some people, I got a couple of them, hey man, that, uh, uh, that, that, that sometimes I want to block myself because every time you turn around, they're telling you every thought that comes to your mind. Baby, everybody don't want to know everything you're thinking about. And some of that stuff you don't even need to be thinking nonetheless everybody reading. And then what's worse is when somebody get out there and start responding to every idle thought. There's some things that happen not because you trying to make your point or because your point ain't valid, but the point is you making a point to a point that shouldn't have been a point in the first place. We get sucked into useless fables, the scripture says, and things that mean nothing. 
bring no value to life. Paul himself later on says, I learned how to fight in good fights, which means every fight ain't a fight worth fighting for. But he said, I used to get caught up in skirmishes and fights that meant nothing, but when he gives credit for his ending of life, he says, I've learned to fight in fights that mean something now. Paul is speaking now Timothy to let him know that life is too short to be caught up in stuff that don't mean anything. Has anybody got to that level of life where you ain't got no time to waste? Anybody, anybody got to that place now where, well, listen, you know, you, you, you got probably more years behind you than you got in front of you, but you just want to make sure you know every day of it counts. I want to talk to some young people. You can have some more years in front of you than you got behind you, and you still don't have no time to waste. Paul challenged him because he said, I know you need an example of self-discipline and focus. And Paul knew that as he was about to leave this earth, this note, this is the last four chapters that he's writing as he's about to go face Nero's chopping block. These last four chapters that he begins to write and he leaves a letter to someone. He, he could have been doing a lot of things. He could have been saying a lot of things, but he takes out time to try to help young Timothy to understand that whatever I'm doing, I want to leave a legacy behind me. And the only way I can do that is to remind you that first of all, that you have to remember that whatever you are or whoever you are, you didn't get there by yourself. Thank God for your mama. Thank God for your grandmama. Thank God that they taught you how to pray. Even if they had to teach you before you went to bed at night or when you wake up in the morning or before you say your prayers before you eat. How many of you still learn how to pray those prayers that your mama or some woman taught you? It may have been a man even in your life, but somebody taught you those prayers. Even before you take a bite of food in your mouth. Hallelujah. They taught you how to pray for food you didn't even see yet. Sometimes mama didn't even have the food on the table. And we were saying grace. But we learned to thank God in advance for stuff that we hadn't yet received. That's why you ought to just thank God in your life when the blessing ain't come yet. The healing ain't come yet. The deliverance ain't come yet. But you ought to thank God like you used to thank him for the food you're about to receive. You ought to thank God for the financial blessing I'm about to receive. For the miracle of healing I'm about to receive. For the deliverance I'm about to receive. You ain't got to see it yet. But look at your neighbor and say, I'm thanking God for what's already on the way. I'm thanking God for what I'm about. Oh, yeah, I see a couple of y'all ready to run right now. How many of y'all know that there's something on the way that's coming that you can anticipate because mama taught you how to pray before the event? Gracious Father, we give thanks. I hope some folk get burn your lips off eating all the time and ain't blessed nothing. I hope you catch every case of virus and rickets, whatever you get. It's an ungrateful spirit that doesn't realize every time you open your mouth that the food you got came from some farmer somewhere that took time to plant and harvest that crop. You ought to thank God before you drink a cup of coffee that there was somebody in South America that took time to make sure you have it. Some cup of tea. Somebody who, who, who manufactured the clothes you put on your body. There was some farmer, some immigrant worker who got less than minimum wage, but yet had the ability to put together some of the things that you enjoy every day. You can't walk out your house without being blessed by somebody else's mama. How many of our mamas had to raise children and then raise somebody else's children? How many people had inventions they never got credit for? You ought to thank God that everything I got and everything I am came because of somebody's mama. Oh, I'm preaching better than you looking at me. <laughs> uh, I know it's a few hundred of y'all ready to run. I'm about to run myself thinking about my mama. But not only did he say to him that you need to remember uh, your mama and thank God for, for mamas, but he, he also said, I want you to remember me. Listen to what he says in the text. He says, I'm thankful not only 
for the unfeigned faith that your grandmother Lois and mother Eunice, who Paul met along the way, who gave young Timothy to him. He did have a father who was of Greek background. He did have a father. He wasn't an absentee father, but he couldn't help Timothy go to the next level. You ought to thank God that no matter how far you can take your child, that there's somebody who will come along who can take you to the next level. Can I get a witness? You ought not be a selfish, stingy steward of your children to think that you got everything that they need. That's the reason why some of them jacked up today. Amen. Because you don't have it all. You need the whole village to help your child become who you are. How many of you all met some people along your journey that took what your mama and grandmama and village started and helped them to become to another level where you are? How many got some people, some uncles who weren't really your uncles, some aunties who weren't really your aunties, some big mamas and big daddies and church folk and people in your life and even employees, employees, deacons, mothers, and pastors who helped you become who you were because you couldn't make it this far by yourself? Call out one of their names. Oh, y'all ain't talking good now. Come on. I mean, call out my name, doggone it. I didn't help a whole bunch of y'all out there. Amen. <laughs> At some point, there's somebody that come along the way that has helped you get to where you are. So he not only is thankful for nurturing matriarchs. Somebody say nurturing matriarchs. But he's thankful for also priestly prophetic patriarchs. Yes, he says, I am persuaded it's in you also by the putting on of my hands. Paul is not talking arrogantly. He's talking confidently. The difference between arrogance and confidence is who you put your trust in. Paul says, I'm confident, Timothy, that you're ready for this charge because I know that when I didn't put my hands on you, lay hands in a sign of ordination on you until I knew that some of the right stuff was already in you. We got to be careful how quick we put our hands on people today. We got folk who get saved one day, amen, get called to preach the next week, and they're laying hands on them before the month is out. Amen. Four the years out, and I didn't want to run around to my I'm bishop so and so. You ain't no bishop. You might be the son of, but you ain't. But you ain't no I, bishop. I said bishop. B i s h o p. I ain't thinking about y'all. <laughs> we are more concerned about adjectives than nouns. Everybody's trying to get a tag. Everybody's trying to get a title. Everybody's trying to move one up on the other person. But we got to get to the place, whatever happened to being a decent Christian? Even if you're called of God, can you just be a minister for a while, a servant of God for a while? Can you help somebody for a while before you have to put some tag on your name to make you look better than somebody else? We have a spirit of covetousness and Spirits of jealousies that are nowhere in the family or spirit of God. And if you got it, let me just say, Paul says, I didn't give it to you and neither did God. And some of this stuff we pick up along the way. And it's one of the reasons why our children have turned into things we've never seen before. I've never seen suicide at the level of our young people like I see it right now. I've never seen the issue, even the other week, and I'm praying for the family of the young man, uh, yes, uh, uh, Russell Davis, whose brother, amen, had the unfortunate experience of when his mom and daddy went to pick him up from school and their lives were taken. I don't know what it is that, that allows a person to get to the place and the signals were out there. He was crying out for help and nobody seemed to catch the help that needed to be done. But at the end of the day, it's just hard for me to imagine a young man that is so void that not he would just take his daddy because we know some daddies, amen, have been taken out by some sons. Amen. Some got cut off early. Ask Sam Cook. Come on, talk to me here. Ask Marvin Gaye. Ask, ask some other. That, but, but, but it's something about a boy that will take his mama's life. However you look at it, whatever you say, there's something missing. Ain't no drugs in the world that would have caused me to shoot my mama. 
Come on, ain't, ain't no anger in the world. Ain't no whatever. And at some level, we have reached a level in our community where we have failed to be able to instill things in our children that we're going to need later on. And mamas, that's the reason why you just can't be buddy-buddy with your sons and daughters all the time. Well, I know you can be friendly and friends, but you ain't, that ain't your best friend. You better get you somebody your age. Because at some point, you're going to have to tell that girl to sit down somewhere. Come on, at some point, you're going to tell that boy, listen, boy, now you need to understand I brought you in this world. You may be taller than me, but I'll get a ladder and knock you out. My mama wouldn't need no ladder. My grandma Lucy was five foot nothing. But she'd make you come down to her level and beat you. <laughs> Grandma. <laughs> She wasn't going to raise her voice. She wasn't going to do nothing. And at some point, even the drug dealers respected them. Even the people in the neighborhood and others, they said, don't mess with them kids over there. That, that lady crazy. And when Paul got Timothy, he had a person who had that kind of stuff in him. So when he told him, stop being scared of them people in that church. When he told him, you need to be able to be respectful, but you need to help them to understand how to get at that challenging situation. When he got to the place where there was disrespect in the church and there were people who were talking out of worship and out of turn and people who would try to put down women by taking scriptures like 1 Timothy 2.11 where it says, let the women keep silence and say, can't no woman teach and can't no woman preach or can't no woman tell nothing to church. Listen, everybody in here would have to get out of here if a woman couldn't teach in life because everybody in here learned what you learned because of some woman in your life. So at what point can you misinterpret a scripture like a woman can't teach? Oh, sit down somewhere and thank God for every Sunday school teaching woman that taught when a man wouldn't show up. Thank God for every woman in the house and in the home and in the school classroom and every place else. Thank God for teaching women. Paul says, stop misinterpreting what I'm saying. He didn't say tell women to shut up. He says, I'm telling you to, that there are some places that are not appropriate for some conversations. He says, Timothy, you've allowed confusion to get in the church when the worship should be going on. Men sat on one side, women sat on the other side. And the hostile fell on the house codes was of such. Where in those days in these Greek churches that he was trying to help convert, many of them had to appeal to their husbands in conversation to understand what to do. But they were talking in church. Hallelujah. Like some of y'all want to do, but I, you know, but y'all know better. Amen. Because you know mama ain't going to let you talk to nobody even next to you unless across the aisle. But they would say, no, 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 no. And he said, there's some things you need to take care of at home. Come on, help me here. He said, if you didn't get that understanding before you got here, you need to get to the house and fix some things. He said, be respectful in the house of God. And he said, you're going to have to get them men together by telling the men to lift their hands. And when you lift their hands, your head goes with it. And yes, your, your eyes go with it and your spirit goes. He says, then when you lift their hands, it will focus on God, Timothy, and not on you. Come on, help me, somebody. Then he says, and then tell the women that I said, wait till they get home. And there's some people who want to play hopscotch with scripture. They want the women to shut up, but want the men, don't tell the men in the prayer Woo. they both in the same text so if you want the woman to shut up then tell the men to lift their hands and pray up because he said both of them is going to help your worship preach Reverend Bland thank you sir but we got some misogynistic xenophobic people who just trying to put people down Come on, can't no woman teach me? Well, 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 when I became a man, well, what age was that? Because you about 50 years old and still living in your mama's basement, so when you... And then we want to put our American values on it. Well, you know, a woman can teach a child 
when they in Sunday school, but when they get to be a man, and okay, so what age is that? 18? Okay, so 18, all of a sudden, Scripture says that now you sinning when you teach somebody 19. Is that what you're trying to tell me? You see, we come up with some of the most crazy stuff in the world because we don't want to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Paul was saying to Timothy, Timothy, that what I need you to do is learn how to get away from some of these crazy little fables, and I want you to establish some order in that church. I want you to establish some values in that church because I didn't let you become an ordained minister until I laid my hands on you. And some of us lay our hands too quick. I do believe there's a pastor that says lay hands on nobody suddenly. You ought to take your time. I got people around me I was telling one other day, it's been preaching, ain't got license yet. I know you gave your first sermon a few years ago. Yeah, but you're going to have to keep on preaching and hang around a little bit longer before I put my name on the paper because you won't go nowhere embarrassing me. Tell me I'm Plaster Blanchard. The devil is a lie doing some of the stuff you're doing. Amen. That paper may wait a while. By the time I put my name on it, amen, you're going to be ready for being super preacher or whatever it is. I'd have been burned too many times in life to understand that you just can't put your hands on anybody. You can't donate dignity. It's hard to correct stupidity. There's some things you can't teach. The key to knowledge is truth. And the key to truth is to make sure you get it from the manufacturer. The greatest sin of life is not just ignorance, it's arrogant ignorance. It's not just not knowing that's the problem, but it's acting like you know when you don't know. Watch this, and then don't want nobody to tell you nothing to help your ignorance in the first place. All of us are born ignorant. You didn't come here knowing everything. You got to learn something from somebody. But Paul says, thank you, Lois, thank you, Eunice, that you raised this boy from a child. He knew the scriptures, but you gave me a base. You gave me something to work with. How many of you are grateful that your mama gave somebody something to work with when you got on that job, when you got to that place, when you got on that place? Listen, when you got to the school, you were able to bring some things to the table. I, I feel for some of these teachers trying to teach your child something. They ain't learned the God blessed thing at home. They ain't teaching, they do they performing miracles. I'm closing now. Somebody say, I'm thankful for nurturing matriarchs. I'm thankful for priestly prophetic patriarchs. And as I close that particular area, I thank God, even in my own life. I mentioned the close of a sermon a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about giant killers, about the fact that uh, my license and ordaining pastor, Mac Charles Jones, who Yesterday, uh, uh, it's been 20, I believe now 21 years since his passing. And he, he died early in his life. But one, like King, he was one of the strongest uh, preachers, priests, and prophets of his area and time, in particular in the areas of social justice and, and standing for righteousness and, and interpreting the scripture and understanding what God had to say about the word. And while I came from a strong father, and while I came from a father who nurtured me from birth and took me to church and showed me and taught me the ways of God, and, and he was my pastor, and I, and I thank God for other pastors along the way who God allowed to be able to help me. Pastor Clay Evans, y'all have seen along the way, who now, when well in his 90s, but he still recognizes when I come in his presence. I thank God for nurturing pastors like Pastor Hartsfield and Pastor Copeland, and, and I go down the list of several pastors, and I thank God that they wanted me, but back when I was younger, they didn't just make me their little buddy buddy, but they taught me and I respected them. And by the time I came along, and my father was already deceased, but thank God for people who were Paul's in my life. Who could take me to the next level because I would not be a decent pastor to you had they not been a decent covering for me. So I'm closing by telling you I'm thankful for not only those matriarchs and patriarchs, but I'm thankful for what their legacy produced. You see, because the fact is, they put the ingredients in me. Oh, but they couldn't stir it up. That's something I had to do for myself. 
You see, there's some things they can do to put the ingredients in the jar. Uh, but you got to have your own stir. And that's what's wrong with a lot of preachers and teachers and people today. Is they want somebody to come and do everything for them. I think one of the words we had this week was a word of vision. And some reason why some people have to copycat everything they do off somebody else is because they don't know that they got some gifts that God has given them themselves. But when you got a gift in you, you don't have to copy off nobody else's paper in school. When you got a gift in you, you don't have to listen for nobody else to steal their songs or their inventions. When you got a gift stirred up in you, then you don't have to go to YouTube or somebody else's manuscript to preach a sermon for the next day. When you got a gift stirred up in you, you don't have to ask nobody when it's time to praise or how to praise. Because when you got something on the inside that's stirred up properly, Paul says you need to know that it's something that God has given you. I'm closing here when I tell you that God has put something in you. And one thing that's not in you is a spirit of fear. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, one thing I know, I'm not scared. To give God praise. Tell him because every time I think about it, God's been good to me. And every time I realize it, I realize I got power that's down on the inside. That's power that allows me to speak up. And Paul says, not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness here? Anybody got that kind of power? That when you see wickedness come in high places, you say, I can't beat nobody down at the White House, but I can sure do some praying at my house. Can I get a witness here? Anybody got some prayer power? Anybody got some singing power? Anybody got some walking power? Anybody got some talking power? Anybody got some teaching power? Anybody got some praying power? I wish some powerful people uh, would not look pitiful, uh, but look powerful. Uh, and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got power in my hands. I got power in my feet. I got power in my testimony. I got power in my praise. Is there anybody here that wants to show off your power? And I get a witness here. I got power and I got love. I love even when they hate me. I love even when they despitefully use me. I love when they talk about me, when they scandalize me, when they put me down. I keep on looking up because I got something greater than the power of hate. Look at your neighbor. And say, neighbor, you can't make me hate you because I got love down on the inside. I didn't put it there. The kind of love I had was that Eros love. It's I love you if you can do something for me. It's that Philios love. It's that you, my buddy, and my sister, as long as we agree. But I got something way down called agape love. And Jesus put it in me. I love him because he first loved me. I can give it to you because he made a deposit in me. Is there anybody here that's got a love your mama couldn't give you? Is there anybody here that's got a love your daddy couldn't give you? Ah, is there anybody here that's got the love of Jesus? He loved me so much that one Friday, I wish I had some church folk in here. I said he loved me so much. I shouldn't have to finish this story. I said one Friday. Ah! He stayed there all day Friday. Stayed there all day Saturday. I know Easter's in a few weeks, but can I practice my speech early? Ah! Sunday morning, 
Love got up with all power in his hands. And if you got a sound mind, you ought to jump up on your feet and give God praise and thank God that love lifted me. Say it. Say it. your hands and give God praise. That's enough. I thank God for my mama. I remember the unfeigned faith that dwelt first in my mother and my grandmother. And in not only those matriarchs, but also those patriarchs, those who covered me, priestly prophetic pastors. Ministers, deacons, laymen, just good folk on the block. They didn't have to have no title. But some of you all have some good men in your neighborhood. Amen. Who could help you without having to get you to promise them anything. They didn't have to sleep back around the back door at night because they helped you in the day. But they stood with dignity and respect in the community and they helped you to make it to the next level particularly if you had a husband to die or even one to leave particularly if you had a mama or a daddy that you couldn't always count on not only were they caught up in some other things but sometimes they just were busy trying to perform a job two or three times a day to make sure the children were cared for so thank God for those great daycare workers who didn't have a business. Y'all miss what I just said. We used to call them babysitters, amen. Mama didn't go to no agency, she got the lady next door. We got old enough and she couldn't come over, she just said watch him and she had about 12 windows in that house. We couldn't sneak outside. I mean, I couldn't even go on the roof, she had a telescope up there look like, amen. Thank God for people who cared about people. In the next service, I'm going to talk about how do you stir up the gift in you. You see, because they can put stuff in you, but only you can keep it stirred up. You got the ingredients, but is it settling or is it thoroughly mixed? You got the stuff in you. You got the capacity, but do you have the audacity to use it for Jesus Christ? The doors of the church are open. And somebody who would come right now, I would that you would just be able to. I remember mama and the love 